Give me the child, and I will give you the man. St. Francis Xavier, the founder of the Jesuit movement, is supposed to have said. Religious movements the world over try to shape impressionable minds with myths and fables and fairy stories. How the world began, where the first humans came from, what rainbows are. Now the world's most celebrated atheist, Richard Dawkins, gives a counterblast of fact. His new book, The Magic of Reality, aims directly at children, teaching them how to replace myth with science. It's illustrated by the graphic artist and film director, Dave McKean. Of course, no one really believes that it would be possible to turn a pumpkin into a coach. But have you ever stopped to consider why such things would be impossible? You probably haven't, because from our earliest years, we learn to suspend disbelief. And that, apparently, is also how we condition impressionable brains to absorb religious hogwash. In the creation myth of the Hebrew tribe of the Middle Eastern desert, the tribal god Yahweh created light on the first of his six days of creation. But then, surprisingly, he didn't create the sun until the fourth day. Where the light came from on the first day before the sun and stars existed, we are not told. Knocking down the scientific accuracy of millennia-old stories isn't very hard. Rainbows, earthquakes, the origins of humanity, the origins of the universe itself are all explained in ways that a ten-year-old might follow, but a five-year-old might not. According to the modern version of the Big Bang model, the entire observable universe exploded into existence between 13 and 14 billion years ago. Some scientists will tell you that time itself began in the Big Bang, and we should no more ask what happened before the Big Bang than we should ask what is north of the North Pole. But therein lies Richard Dawkins's problem. Even with him setting them up as Aunt Sally's, the myths remain the better stories, carrying an imaginative charge that makes nonsense easier to understand than fact. Fairy tales of whatever world religion retain an untarnishable beauty, more easily followed by a small and impressionable Tasmanian child, for example. A god called Moini was defeated by a rival god called Dromedina in a terrible battle up in the stars. Before he died, he wanted to give a last blessing to his final resting place, so he decided to create humans. But he forgot to give them knees. He absent-mindedly gave them big tails like kangaroos, which meant they couldn't sit down. They say the devil has all the best tunes, but the religious elders have most of the best stories. Well, Richard Dawkins is here. You seem to implicitly believe in this, or explicitly believe, that rationalism is somehow disadvantaged. Do you really think it is? No, and nor am I knocking myths. I mean, I think, I think myths are great. I just think that science is better. And actually, better stories, I deny that the myths have the best tunes and the best stories. You deny it? Yes. I mean, I what actually think that science is so spellbinding... What have you got that beats that story of the kangaroo? <laughs> Evolution. Well, I t OK, right, let's take evolution. Okay. You really think that your version, your very clear account of where our ancestors came from, which ends up in a not very attractive looking fish 185 million generations ago, as opposed to the creation myth in the Bible that God takes a handful of dust, breathes life into it, takes one of Adam's ribs and creates a woman. You think yours is more poetic, do you? No question about it, absolutely. It is wonderfully poetic. When you think about it, here we are. We started off on this planet, this fragment of dust spinning around the sun, and in four billion years, we gradually changed from bacteria into us. That is a spellbinding story. Do you uh, accept that it is slightly more difficult for a child to comprehend? That I'm not sure about. It's conventional not to teach evolution until a later age. I think it could be taught at a younger but age. But 185 million generations, that's kind of a difficult thing to get your head around it, as uh, a child. Yes, it is. And you have to employ careful strategies to do that. But I but think it can be done. Now, nobody believes that Lot's wife, for example, was really turned to a pillar of salt, and you soon grow out of uh, belief in Father Christmas or the Tooth Fairy. Are you saying that these things should never be taught? No, I'm not, actually. I think that, that there's a great value in training the imagination to be imaginative. And so 
um, children love to make believe, for example. I did myself, I'm sure you did. And it's a wonderful part of growing up to play games of make believe. And part of it is comfort, isn't it? I mean, if you are told, uh, that's, I don't want to get too much into religion, but yeah. if you're told that you are a unique creation made in God's image, loved by God and the rest of it, as opposed to the scientific conclusion which you must come to, that you are a pretty insubstantial speck in the cosmos, one is comforting, one is slightly alarming, isn't it? Uh, one is false and one is true. Uh, <laughs> And it is rather important, to, whether it's alarming or not, I think, to get what's true. Uh, you can make up any number of stories that are comforting, but um, the truth has some value as well. But you accept the force, the imaginative force of comfort. I wouldn't stress comfort. I mean, I accept the imaginative force of, of certain myths, and, and I throw in the Judeo-Christian myth along with the myths but, of the Tasmanians and so on. But I genuinely think that science is more exciting they, and more poetic. They perform a social function too, particularly the religious myths, in that they tend to make us as societies hang together. You don't believe that, do you? Well, it's certainly the <laughs> basis of our culture and our legal system. It is true that historically religions have been the basis of, of our culture, but it's also, they've also been the basis of plenty of things that are not very desirable. Um, as for comfort, I think once again I would come down to what is true and say that what I would really value is the truth rather than what's comforting and the truth rather than what necessarily holds societies together. And at what age? This book is intended for children, what, 11, 12, 12 13? 12 and up to 100, I mean, uh, okay. all what, adults. Uh, why can't you introduce children to reality at a younger age than that? I would love to do that and maybe my next book will. Um, I, this book was kind of field tested down to about eight or seven and they got it with, tape, with help okay. from teachers so I would like to think that parents could perhaps read bits of this book to seven year olds and eleven and twelve year olds I hope will love to read it themselves. But this is the equivalent at an entire metaphysical level to telling children that Father Christmas doesn't exist isn't it? <laughs> well. I think that the truth is wonderful. I do think but that myths are fun. And I mean, the book is full of myths. It, it, sure. Which is your favourite myth, by the way? I like the one about Dromedina and the, the, the one that you heard Lala actually reading. I think that's a lovely one. It's very amusing. There, some of the Aztec ones are very, are very funny as well. You can't pronounce the names. Do you find any of them affecting, personally affecting? You think, gosh, what a wonderful story. Um, actually, Genesis is, um, mm -hmm. as a as a story, as a, as a myth, yes. And I mean, as long as you don't think it's true, the trouble is that 40% of the American people think it's literally true. And do they we, probably think Lot's wife was turned into a pillar of salt as well, for that matter. Do you really care that there are a lot of stupid people around? I do, actually, yes. I really do. I mean, I care that children are being misled by those stupid people. I Why? care that children... Because I think that children deserve to know what's true and what's wonderful about the world into which they've been born. It really is true and it really is wonderful. And it's such a, a crying shame if children are denied that by ignorant and stupid adults as you've described them. Richard Dawkins, thank you. Thank you.